Hamilton. Her genres include travel, music, mystery, and murder. Pima County Public Library has multiple copies of 10 of Dr. Ransdell's titles, with more on the way. Special thanks to Hughes Federal Credit Union for their generous support of this program and other projects of the Friends of the Bear Canyon Library. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ransdell. Thank you, that's, that's very sweet. Actually, it's funny because, yeah, I, I, I stayed in school long enough to get a doctorate, but my initials are DR, and I had a childhood friend with my same first name, which is Diane, so my friends call me DR, and my students who think they're very funny um, sometimes have figured out that, to call me uh, DR squared, so they think that's, you know, particularly enlightening or something like that. Can, you, can everybody hear me okay? Yes, okay, great. Well, Elise said, start with some music, wake everybody up. And I said, no, it's seven o'clock, they'll be awake. They'll be relaxing with their glasses of wine. But no, okay, just to, you know, in case you happen to be almost sleeping, my dad, for example, uh, this is the stuff I do. It looks like the violin is very big when I do it on Zoom. It's really, it's really not, although I'm not that tall and people have sometimes accused me of playing a viola, but that's not true. It's just a violin. I just, it looks big on me. What can you do? I was very disappointed at Christmas time to find out that my 10 year old niece is now taller than I am. <sighs> oh, well, she was very excited about it though. Anyway, um, First of all, thanks to the library, the Friends of the Library, Kirk Bear Canyon Library for inviting me and for Elise for setting this up because really it's such a pleasure to be able to talk to, to readers. And since the library's got some of my books now, it's easy for you guys to get them. It'll be pretty easy for you to get them. And I'll go ahead and launch into a little bit of information about music and writing and something like that. Now, if everything goes right, I can share my screen. I can do a slideshow. And okay, looks like we might be in business. So you already know the name of the talk. I gotta find a little arrow there. Okay, great. So, well, what is really the role of music and fiction? And um, well, one of the things it does, you know, it adds dimension and why not? add a little music to our lives. We have it in many aspects. It can be in fiction too, but here's the thing. It can do a lot. So for setting, for example, you know, as a person sitting alone, listening to silence, a cat's purr, or in my case, you know, cat fighting or something like that, a TV. So there's a lot of different things that, that you can do with music. The other day I ran into a very interesting example. I hadn't I had had this book for a while. I don't even know how I acquired it. But in the very second chapter, we meet Kurt Wallander. Probably some of you are familiar with that series. But I thought it was very interesting the way he uses music to introduce this character. So he was asleep. He'd stayed up far too long the night before, listening to recordings of Maria Callas that a good friend had sent him from Bulgaria. When the telephone roused him, he was deep in a dream. As if to reassure himself that he'd only been dreaming, he reached out and felt next to him, but he was alone in the bed. Neither his wife, who had left him three months ago, nor the singer was there. And I thought, wow, this was a very interesting way to get started on that, to get started on that book. It's hard to see the little arrows, darn it. But when I stopped to think about it, of course, I already had this talk in mind, but I thought, well, what all does the author accomplish by using this character well? We introduce this guy and we find, okay, he's missing his wife. It's like been three months, so it's not been very long, but he presumably knows something about music. Opera is actually kind of an acquired taste and even a lot of people who like classical music haven't acquired the taste for opera. But I like that incongruity because I wouldn't think necessarily of a detective as being a big opera fan. So that gave me a dimension for how to think about him and kind of start getting getting to know him. Um, whoops, 
I managed to skip a slide because I went too fast. Then today when I was swimming, I remembered another very, very nice opening that has, to, has a lot to do with music is from Haruki Murakami's IQ84, which is a terrific novel. I, I really, really love it. And I knew it started with music. And when I went back and looked at it today, um, this is how it starts. The taxi's radio is tuned to a classical FM broadcast. Janáček's Sinfonietta, probably not the ideal music to hear in a taxi caught in traffic. The middle-aged driver didn't seem to be listening very closely either. How many people could recognize Jan Janáček's Sinfonietta after hearing just the first few bars? Probably somewhere between very few and almost none. But for some reason, Aomame was one of the few who could. Now she's the protagonist. She's one of two protagonists, but for me, what this did was it really made me curious as to, well, what's going on with this? And I thought, well, what all, what all does the author gain? Well, right from the, right from the get-go, to me, the protagonist seems very special. She shows, uh, he shows that we're in a very particular world. It's not just, you know, oh, classical music is a very particular piece. But I thought also it shows a big confidence in the reader because yeah, a lot of people might not know about it. And, and so maybe they might think, oh, well, you know, maybe I don't want to read about this person. On the other hand, it might make us very curious. So I thought it was a terrific move on Murakami's, start, uh, Murakami's part to start the novel that way. Well, anyway, let me just flip that question. So we could ask, what's the role of, of fiction from music? So, well, musicians can explain some of the joy of their work, some of their difficulties, um, paints a very unique setting, can give some readers who are maybe not as musical some insights as to what's going on. In fact, I just was hearing about that before we got started. And then also, even musicians can learn about new kinds of music. So there's all kinds of good purposes. But I'll back up for, for one moment and I'll just say, so, well, what makes fiction great? Well, for one thing, I would argue that you wanna place the reader in a particular world. And including music is an important part of this. And I would just ask you guys to think, you know, which, which of your favorite novels has music as a key element? You might have some. In fact, it's sort of interesting because for me, actually, I would say you know, probably my favorite books are The Lord of the Rings, The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. And even though there's lots and lots of things in those books, there's also a lot of music because you've got the dwarves singing right off the bat. You've got the elves singing. You've got Hop Bilbo writing songs. So it's just interesting to consider that. Well, when I started thinking about this talk, I thought, well, I better do some research. Actually, Jay gave me a, a couple of good hints and, and I started looking into things. Well, if you are brave enough to go to Wikipedia and ask for the category of novels about music, I think they list about a hundred or so, most of which I have to say I haven't read, but the one that's probably the most well-known would probably be The Phantom of the Opera. Most of you are probably familiar with the musical and not with the novel, but that's how it started as a, no as a novel in French. But music critic Ted Joya, yeah, he, he claims that, well, fiction and music make a very difficult marriage. And in fact, in his article, he wrote a whole article about it and I can give you these slides later, you can take a closer look. But he only gives 10 examples of novels where music is comfortably married um, married to the novel. So it's very interesting. And he liked High Fidelity as a good example, which later became a movie that, I don't know, I didn't like it that much, but it's an example. The point is just that there's lots and lots of books that do have music angles. That site about great books has a lot of information about novels that have music. So those would be another thing you might really want to check out. But it's interesting because even on something like Goodreads, which probably a lot of you are familiar with, people can categorize under music fiction. So there's a lot of interest in music and in the way music can be incorporated in fiction. I started taking music lessons when I was really young. I started with piano and then I was about 10 when I started playing the violin. So I should be Itzhak Perlman, but I am not, I am sorry. That's very disappointing. But 
Anyway, I think the first time I was really aware of a use of music in fiction had to do with A Clockwork Orange, which I read in high school. It was in high school AP class. Probably some of you know it, or you might know the Stanley Kubrick film. Anthony Burgess has actually written a lot about music, and he also is composed, so he's been in, in both worlds of that. In that novel, if you don't happen to remember, um, the main character, Alex, who's a terrible person, loves Beethoven. But he's a really terrible person. And I remember in high school writing a paper about how, well, even though he's a bad person, because he loves music, he has a redeeming quality. Now, I'm pretty sure that that paper is lost, and it's probably good, because I don't know if I would agree with myself now. But it was an interesting way to find out a little bit. Anyway, I'll go on and I'll tell you a little bit about some of my experiences. So I was lucky enough to be able to start playing in an orchestra when I was in high school. My violin teacher was the personnel director at the Decatur Millican Civic Symphony. He slid me in, it was great, it was a paying job. When I finished school, I got a degree actually to teach Spanish and I went to Mexico to work on my Spanish. I was able to play in an orchestra there and that was a lot of fun. I met people, it was very interesting, but I also found a really new dimension of music for me. And that had to do with, well, a few things played into it. For one thing, we were poor. We were making, I went down there right after they devalued the silly pesos. So I was hired originally, I was gonna be making $650 a month. And then by the time I got down there, it was about half that. So we were poor. I knew a bunch of other teachers were all poor. So we would spend Saturday nights at Flavi's house and we would sit around singing. It's so interesting, but that's how things work in Mexico. Not in, not in every culture, but in Mexico, it certainly does. People enjoy the same tune. So people like their parents' music and their grandparents' music and music goes down through the ages in a way that I had never been accustomed to because, you know, yeah, I listen to some of my mom's Johnny Mathis records, but I, we don't have the same music or anything like that. So these Saturday nights were a revelation and what we would do, we had what's called cancioneros. We had these cheap publications that had the word lyrics and Flavi had a guitar. Usually somebody would show up that had another guitar and we would sing songs for hours. What did I do? Of course, I had to get a guitar because I felt like I was left behind. The violin really didn't help for Saturday nights at Flavi's but it was great to get a guitar, teach myself a few chords and start learning songs. Well, I love being in Mexico, but I didn't make any money. I might've mentioned that. So I, I came back to the States. People had told me I'd probably like Arizona because it's warm and Hispanic. And in fact, it's been a very good match for me. I've been here for quite a while. Well, when I first got to Tucson, I really, 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 really missed Mexico. And through hook or crook, a couple of people know because they already read the memoir, I got myself into a mariachi. And that was really important for me because I missed Mexico so much. And I missed my Saturday nights at Flavi's. So some things about mariachi. It's not easy. This is why. It's not written down. Now, there are some teachers around town who are indeed, they're, they're teaching like middle school students or high school students, and they've written out some parts. So now some of the kids learn from the written music, but I never did. I learned everything by memory. Actually, I would um, take a tape recorder to the sets and I would record the sets and practice. And actually the trumpet player helped me. He would write things, he would, he would write down the intro for me, you know, just the, the first few bars of the intro so that I could at least have a beginning of the song. That was really hard. Actually, I have to say that the tunes are not that hard, mostly. There's a couple that are very hard to play, but the tunes aren't that hard. It's this vast, vast repertoire, because here's the problem. It's not like you can know 10 songs. You are supposed to know like everybody's grandpa's favorite song. So that's a big repertoire. Also, Mexico is a big country. So lots of songs, lots of music. That was a really big, big challenge for me. But one of the things I like the most, and some of you remember um, I, this restaurant, I um, started out playing at El Mariachi restaurant. Gilbert, Gilbert Velez hired me. 
Uh, we played on stage most of the time, but we would. there were moments where we would walk out into the audience and get to know them. I love that. I love that closeness because in most classical playing, you know, you're, you're in the audience and the, the players are very far away from each other. And in fact, classical music is a little bit serious. You're not supposed to smile. If you make a mistake, you're supposed to not show it. Mariachi was completely different. We would be right there with people and they would talk to us. And sometimes I might start a song late because I was answering a question or something like that. Also, people got to ask for requests. So we would at least try to play their favorite songs. At the peak of El Mariachi, when I was working there, I worked there for about 15 years before they went out of business, we were playing five times a week. Actually, that wasn't so good for my writing career, but it was really good for my playing. I learned a lot of songs. So even though I need to brush up on them, they're back there in the memory. Anyway, almost getting off track here. Oh yeah, so it's not fiction, but I did write a memoir about, uh, about doing mariachi. Yeah, not fiction. It might read like fiction. There's a couple of incidents you might think that sounds crazy, but actually it's not fiction. We had a lot of adventures when we were playing together, but it's kind of off the topic for tonight, but I just wanted to throw that in. Let me take you to Greece, which is where my background is right now, Corfu, I think. In 1990, ooh, shouldn't have said the year. I went on a university trip to Greece and it was run by a guy named John Solomon. Um, it, was, it was wonderful. We, we traveled around for about three weeks and we would get to some place like Mycenae and John Solomon would jump off the bus and he would say, it doesn't get any better than this. And I thought he was right. I loved it. I loved every moment. And Al Leonard was the, was the other professor. Between the two of them, they taught us about the peristyle and the stylobates and all that stuff. But the best thing that John Solomon did for me, actually, was when we were in Athens and we asked, where should we go tonight? He said, go to the top of Nisikileos Street, which is in the Plaka, and listen to a group that plays at the restaurant at the Taverna called Giros Tumoria the old man of Moria, and we did. And guess what we found? Bazooki musicians. It was terrific. Poor Lucy, a good friend of mine was there and she got bored with all the music. But anyway, for me, it was wonderful. There were these musicians, small group, four or five, four, I think, first night. They played all night. They talked to one another while they played. They took requests from the audience. They seemed to be having a good time. And even though they sat down and we always stand up, they seem just like us. I was so impressed. Here I was in Greece. And yet, it, in so many ways, it was like being back at El Mariachi, although they didn't take any breaks. At El Mariachi, we got our breaks. But anyway, so what happened? It was love. It really was. I fell in love with the bazooki, with the sound of Greek music, with Greek I was just fascinated because it seems so, so beautiful. So, I don't know, so sensual. Let me just give you just a, a um, little bit of a chorus. Um, uh, um, there's a song I really like that's called Make the Bed for Two. And here's the chorus to it. It goes, Stroseto stromasu ya dio ya menakeya sena so make the bed for two and you know everything is good in our world when we have our our bed all ready to go anyway i fell in love with with these sounds and with the minor keys and with the words I couldn't understand very many of the words, but I thought, oh, Greek, well, you know, I've studied Spanish, I've studied some Italian. How hard could Greek be? Hard, very hard, never mind. But nevertheless, I started learning some Greek and I started learning some songs. Actually, I wanted to learn Greek to, to understand what the, what the music had to say. But how did that play into my writing? Well, here is my first published novel. I have a couple of that are still in the drawer or on the disc that will never see light of day. 
I wrote Amorosia Nights. I made up a place. I made up my own island, Amoros, because I didn't want to make mistakes. So I made up my own island. And for my protagonist, you know, I took a mariachi player. Oh, somewhat like me. Oh, and she meets some people who are from Greece at the restaurant, and they invite her to Greece. It's my dream vacation. Anyway, in the novel, she goes to Greece. She goes to hear the bazooki, loves it, and then she has a golden moment. Now, let me explain about a golden moment. So in mariachi, like I said, there's many, 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 many songs. I started playing in about a, in November of the first year I was here. And that summer, I practiced a lot. I spent most of that summer in Mexico. I practiced, practiced, practiced. There's still so, so, so darn many songs. But that next year is about September. And our main violinist couldn't go that day. And Gilbert, he was stuck taking the three apprentices, me and two others, to play at this guy's house. And he asked for one chatasquiado. And I had worked on it. Now, I'd only worked on it in the key of F. And the singer, who was the trumpet player, he usually sang it in the key of G. But he said, that's OK. I'll play it. I'll sing it in the key that you know. Ha! So for that one moment, I had the right song at the right time. It was such a beautiful moment. And Gilbert gave a hard time to those other two because they've been playing for a while. It was beautiful because usually I didn't have those golden moments. And the very, very next song was a waltz that they also didn't know. And I knew. So it can happen. You can have a golden moment when you have the right song at the right time, but not very often. But of course, I use this in the novel. So they're, they're at the taverna and then somebody wants to hear this special song and Rachel offers to sing it. And the band leader, he looked at me as if I were crazy. He stood motionless, perhaps contemplating the worst possible scenario, which would be that I didn't really know the words and sang off key. I started to get up, but stopped and settled back down to look nonchalant. I finished my brandy in a big swig. Vangelis approached our table. Palo Gexeris, you know the words. I nodded, sol, key of G. His eyes widened back home. Customers often asked to sing, but they never knew their keys. So actually that's another, another thing that happens so, so often that El Mariachi people you know, would come up to sing. They never know what key they sing in. And so then you're trying to guess. Usually you can sort of look at the person and guess, but sometimes we were wrong and somebody came up we didn't like. Sometimes we guessed wrong on purpose. Oh, well, anyway, that's, that's a key thing in this novel. So in Amorosia Nights, here was some stuff I was trying to do. I had this setting. A lot of the action takes place at O Capitanios, the captain, a taverna. And I was able to cover a few themes that were really important to me. So love of music, island life, which I love, music and culture, and especially language learning. Yeah, there's a, there's a love interest too, but the language learning has always been very important to me. I've spent a lot of time working on language and Greek certainly is this big challenge. So I have fun in the novel, having her slowly trying to learn some words and learn how to play and that's, that's how I used music in that novel. I thought it was a lot of fun. Rachel had a good time. But then here's the thing. Wow, that yellow is kind of bright. I wanted to write a mystery. So um, here's the thing. My house is 1,300 feet or, or 13, yeah. It's a small house. But when I'm painting it, I have to say it's a very, 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 very big house. and. My dad came and visited and he said, you should paint this house. And so we bought all the paint and then it started raining and then my parents left town and I'm stuck painting this house. Just took forever. But while I was doing that, all of a sudden I had this picture of a mariachi player at a restaurant playing as usual from memory, which is what you do. And I saw him observing the boss's wife who was flirting not with the boss. So here he is in a dilemma, watching what's going on. He doesn't know what to do. But that's the setup that came to me. And so that's how Andy Vera Cruz was born, because I had to do this long painting project. And his first book turned out to be Mariachi Medler. Now, the original title was Mariachi Murder. Long story, different publisher. Anyway, the new one is Mariachi Medler. 
And I was able to incorporate quite a few musical elements in that novel. So most of it takes place, again, at a mariachi restaurant. You'll notice the theme of music. There are professional music musicians who really know the songs. And it's a tight knit, knit group. When I was at El Mariachi, there were about five of us. You know, the, the people would change from year to year, but there were some people I played with for years. And I really know, even now, usually I play with Tony Reese and some of his friends, well, the Valenzuela brothers. I know them really well. I've played with them for a really long time. And that creates sort of a certain camaraderie, which can be useful in a, in a murder mystery. A couple of other things that I incorporated. Well, we get a lot of repeat customers who would come back, you know, every Friday, stuff like that and ask for their favorite songs. And in the novel, I use a, I talk about a couple of bits and pieces of songs, but as in most cases, business comes first. So while Andy only cares about the music, his boss is more practical. So let me just share a little bit that's from the beginning of the novel. So the boss calls Andy up to the office. How's it, how did things go? Things went fine until that drunk insisted on singing with us. Hmm. Volunteer singers were a common nuisance. When a guest singer approached the stage while clutching a tacate, we knew we were in trouble. He wasn't so bad, Rolanda said. This was not true. The balling crooner with the straw cowboy hat had started off beat and never found his way on. He mangled intonation as if it were a matter of style. The crowd loved him, Rolanda continued. His friends loved him. Everyone else whipped out cell phones so they wouldn't have to pay attention. Lighten up, Andy. You take everything too seriously. He forgot the last verse of El Moro de Cumpas. Everybody knows which horse won the race. Big deal. So El Moro de Cumpas, it's a, it's a law, actually quite a long song about a horse race. And a lot of times when somebody sings the last line, they change it. And so instead of se perdió, ganó. And anyway, we have, always have fun with that song. The point is it for Andy, this is inexcusable. That somebody would leave out the very most important part of the song because he's so focused on the music. He's really not focused on anything else, which is why it's so easy for him to get embroiled in a mystery. And then Rolando goes out of town, Andy has to take over and he's not used to the business end of things. So he gets himself into quite a bit of trouble. He gets himself into so much trouble that at the end of that novel, he needs a vacation. So. Where should he go on vacation? Of course, he should go to Greece. I should say, I should explain that for about 10 years in a row, I went to Greece for vacation. I dragged my sister, I dragged my mom. Well, they weren't, you know, they, they weren't crying too much when, when we did that. And then I taught in Greece for a year, although that didn't go so well. So anyway, but for vacation, I send Andy and I let him meet Rachel. So he goes to Amros too. I used a couple of the, I borrowed some elements that I used in Amorosian Night. So he sits in with the Baziki group. But what's what's nice is that, you know, we can learn more about his character that way. And the flexibility that he gets because of this music. So he gets to appreciate a new place via the music. He gets to blend in. And for a mystery novel, this is important. He gets access to a specialized environment. He goes off on kind of on the wrong track a couple of times, but the music is his sort of calling card. And Again, I get to share things with readers that they probably wouldn't know that much about. So it's a double fun. Well, when I got to the next mystery, I was looking for a new way to have a little bit of fun with music. So um, yeah, I modeled my nemesis after a common type we got at El Mariachi, which was the guy who wants us to hear the same song over and over and over and over. A couple of you read the memoir and yeah, for example, one time, well, it's not uncommon, we might be um, doing a, a, a thing at a cemetery and somebody would ask for, oh, play this. It was my mom's favorite song. And we would play it and they'd be, oh, sing that. It's my mom's favorite song. And we would, you know, sing it like five or six times in a row. Anyway, believe me, people do that. And if they're paying for it, well, it's okay. Anyway, I wanted to have some fun with music in this novel set in Durango, where I lived in Mexico. And I thought, well, wouldn't it be fun to use that kind of guy as the main person? And so I make the, the bad guy someone who's in love with the song El Rey. It's like Don Quixote. He hears this song so often, he just kind of like goes crazy. Now, El Rey is my favorite song to absolutely hate. 
there's a couple that I really hate, but El Rey is one of them. And you probably can guess that it means the king. It starts like this. Yo sé bien que estoy afuera, pero el día en que yo me muera, sé que te vas a llorar. Oh, I know you kicked me out, but the day I die, you're going to cry and cry. <sighs> you know what's really annoying is that even women ask for this song. I just don't get it. And then the chorus, um, the, the end of the song, No tengo trono ni reina, ni nadie quien me comprenda, pero sigo siendo el rey. So I don't have a throne or a queen, but I am still the king. And what I say to that, get over yourself. In fact, it was songs like this that actually led me to, to write a whole mariachi CD. And anyway, so many of the songs are like that. You have to really take them tongue in cheek. But I had a lot of fun making this character sort of crazy. And he's always listening to El Rey. In fact, he has it on a tape and he listens to it over and over and over and over and over. And you can imagine that that would do something to your head. So this gives Andy some secret weapons because he can understand this guy. He can anticipate some of the things the guy's going to do. And uh, he knows, he knows he's, he's got to take this guy seriously because he's like seriously crazy. In the meantime, in this book, I had some fun because Andy needs a new job and he auditions for an orchestra. So I was able to describe in detail how bad that is. Want to know how bad it is? It's awful. I've auditioned for TSO, Tucson Symphony Orchestra, a couple of times. Wow, they're way better than I am. And auditions are really horrible. I can't remember being more scared. I'm going to be defending my dissertation, but anyway, very bad. But I, I, I really have a lot of fun putting Andy through this audition. But what you want to do in fiction, you make, make characters who are larger than life. So he skates through the audition, which leads him to his next book. So I put him in the world of classical music. But for him, that's a big challenge. And there's, a, there's several reasons that it's a big challenge. But the biggest is that he doesn't fit in this orderly classical world. He's used to the chaos of working in a restaurant where you're playing and then the waiter runs into you or you know people stop you and you have to listen to them. Or you're even trying to sing and they're handing you notes about the next song that they want. Well, he's used to this. It's the world he's so used to. And then all of a sudden, he's in this classical world where he's going he's gonna to have to read the music. Wow, that's a discipline to have to read the music and not have your eyes being, you know, look all over the place. And in mariachi, even though you learn a song a certain way and you usually play it a certain way, you have some variations. We play Guantanamera so many times that we have little bitty variations on it that make it fun for us. For La Bamba, there's a bunch of different verses. So every time we sing it, you know, somebody will throw in a different verse. There's, there's, some, there's some fun to it, but classical music just doesn't work in the same way. Another problem for Andy, you know, he's used to being the band leader and he's used to calling the shots. And now he's not going to be able to do that. He's going to have to follow a conductor. Now, I had really a lot of fun with this, with this novel. One of the things that I do now, I play with the Southern Arizona Symphony. Well, we're not, we haven't played a lot. We did two concerts in the fall, but we're not playing a lot right now. But one of the things is that I have this really fun friend of mine who is the conductor. His name is Linus Lerner. And he's, he's um, I don't know, a Cracker Jack, a Fireball. He's really, really fun. He's an unusual conductor. He's from Brazil. He started doing folk music. And then he went to classical music. He also studied opera. He has a degree for opera. So he's done all kinds of different things. But I was able to use him as a model for one of the main characters. Now, if you look at my website, I've got some videos where uh, when I did the book launch for this book, I interviewed, my mom interviewed him and it was really, really fun. But she said to me when she was just reading this book, helping me um, with some of the grammar, she said, you know, people are going to think you're creative, but you're not. You stole him and you put him right in your book. But that's what you get to do as an author. You take some things that are true, you turn them around, and then you have fun with them. Well, anyway, so I put Andy in, in this orchestra. Here's the beginning of this book. And he finds out right away that he's just a terrible fish out of water. So the beginning starts 22, yours, 16. But Zoran gave me a deal. I was waiting, this is Andy's voice. I was waiting for the start of my first rehearsal with Tucson's professional orchestra. 
but I already felt more displaced than an opera singer with permanent laryngitis. The two violinists sitting behind me were discussing how expensive their instruments were. The young men weren't talking in hundreds. They were talking in thousands. Ah! Now, Andy goes on to explain that, you know, he's got a standard Roth violin, which I've got a standard Roth violin that I've had since, you know, the 70s. Works pretty well for most mariachi situations, but in a professional orchestra like Tucson Symphony, those people have instruments that cost quite a bit more than that. And 22,000, 16,000, that is not unusual in the least. Now, a kind of a fun thing that I used in this book, I put a real person in it, and the real person I put in it is Zoran Stiller, who is a local luthier. He's from Croatia. He's been in the States for a long time, and he makes instruments. He, in fact, he makes beautiful instruments. And the instrument you heard me playing earlier is one that Zoran made. So I, too, now have a wonderful Zoran instrument. The problem with that is that actually, even if you have a really, really wonderful instrument, it only plays the notes that you know how to play. That's the best it does. Anyway, I sometimes don't feel like I do that violin justice, but I've got it anyway. And here's Andy, knowing from the beginning of the book that he is in deep trouble being in this group of musicians, even though he plays really well. I have a lot of fun with, with Andy and Substitute Soloist. I make, him, I make him be on stage. And then of course, terrible things happen because he kind of has bad luck, but he's a good player. So he gets, some, he gets a, a few shortcuts because of that, but he also gets himself into a lot of trouble. I'll let you find out more about him later with that. But by making him such a good musician, okay, he's flexible. Um, and he's used to being in these tough spots where you're in front of an audience and then something goes wrong. It's happened to me many times. Your string breaks, um, you get distracted. There's a noise at the other end. Of, I don't know, just all kinds of things I'm used to. And he, he can think past the written page and he's more observant than the other musicians because he's used to being observant and he's not used to tunnel vision. Trust me, in an orchestra rehearsal, everybody's like, focused on the music. You don't have time to look up and flirt. How boring. Anyway, right now I'm working on the next Andy book. I'm almost done. But of course, you have to make things worse. That's the way it works in fiction. You want to always challenge your characters to worse things. What's worse than being a soloist? Well, I make him teach high schoolers who don't care and can't play. You know, when, when I hear that so, you know, when a, when a friend says, oh, my, my child is going to start to play the violin, I say, I'm sorry. Jack Benny said that the violin was the only instrument you had to practice to sound bad at. And, you know, I really, I really do feel for people whose kids are playing the violin, including my parents. You know, my, my niece started going, to, uh, when she was very young, she took some dance lessons and we went to a dance recital and the kids were terrible. Oh my gosh, you know, they're supposed to go like this and they're going like, oh, ah, you know, all kinds of terrible things. But it was a delight to watch a bad dance performance. My parents had to go hear orchestra concerts that were bad. Yeah, I'm sorry. Anyway, I put Andy in this situation of trying to teach these high schoolers, you know, they, they can't play their instruments. They keep che checking their cell phones. It's really bad. Anyway. It gives him quite a challenge. And that's what he's working on in this novel. So to me, that's even worse than putting him on stage. He's got to work with these terrible kids. Poor Andy, happens to the best of us. Uh, what does he do? Well, he simplifies the music, but they still can't play. Then he has to lower his expectations. And then of course it's a murder mystery. So, you know, some other stuff happens, but he's miserable. He does learn. Beyond any doubt, he is no teacher. So that's that's coming up. I'm I'm getting there. I'm not quite I'm not quite there yet, but there we go. So fun with Andy's a teacher, you know, how hard it is. It you know hints at how hard it is to train young musicians, give an idea of you know how much patience you have to have. I've been taking violin lessons for about 10 years, and I'm telling you, the guy is a saint because in a violin, not only can you play one note wrong, 
then you have to learn how to do double stops and then you play two notes wrong at the same time. I, 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 could, I couldn't do it. I'd rather teach writing. Lots of things go wrong in writing, but it doesn't sound as bad. Anyway, what, I'll be able to give you know, readers a sense of how difficult this is. I think it'll be a fun novel. Poor Andy. Yes, wake us. So, so, you know, future books, I'll probably look for other ways to incorporate some music. Um, I have fun sharing, you know, things about mariachi. I've, I've heard people tell me, wow, I didn't know that that's what the outfits look like and all that. So it's really interesting. And, you know, um, I have to, um, I, I get a chance to, to have book launches with musicians. I invite my musician friends. Kathy's been one. That was a lot of fun. So that's what I do. Anyway, if you need a mariachi gig, let me know and I'll be happy to play for you. And I'm going to say, well, thanks a lot for, for listening, for listening all this time. That's a lot of talking, but let me stop the share and then I can just see if you have other questions or anything else you'd like to know about music. And unfortunately, I've got to plug in my, just a second, I have to plug in my computer or I will go dark any second now. I tried to get everything um, figured out ahead of time, but I don't have a very good sticking. I don't have a very good battery. All right. But now I am ready for any questions. Okay, great. That was just so interesting, DR. I just learned a lot. Um, and if you have questions, the easiest thing to do is just uh, go down to your little chat at the bottom of your screen, click on that and just type your little question in there and I'll be real happy to ask DR. Um, one of the, uh, uh, Jody asked, have your bandmates read your books and what do they think? You know, that's a very good question. They've been very, um, well, well, I was gonna say they've been very supportive and then I have to take it back. Um, <laughs> the, the memoir, so it's dedicated to Gilbert and, and my friend Cookie because they've played with me a lot. And Gilbert was delighted, you know, because I left out a couple things that I could have complained about in terms of Gilbert and playing at El Mariachi. Um, but for the most part, you know, I, I, he, he came off pretty well. He is a pretty good guy. He gave me a job, et cetera, et cetera. He was delighted. But actually, the guys haven't been too interested. The other guys I talked about. Now, in that memoir, I changed the names to protect the guilty. I also changed the instrument. So, you know, I called, you know, Juanito, you know, who played the vihuela. Well, it was a different name and it was a different instrument, but they all know who they were. So it's funny that, no, they were not very supportive of that particular work. Um, and when I did the mariachi CD, also, they were not very supportive because guess what? Those lyrics didn't say how great men were. They, they talked about how terrible they were. I mean, I was kidding, but still, you have to have a counterpart to El Rey at some point in your life. Now, when it came to the mysteries, Tony Reese, who I play with the most, he, he's read them and he's really enjoyed them. Now, the, the two brothers I often play with, uh, Rudy and his brother Jaime, I've given them copies, but I suspect that those copies might be currently unread, not that they're not being supportive, but just... They don't tend to sit around picking up mysteries. They're too busy learning new songs. But anyway, that was an excellent question. Thank you. OK, another question is, what was it like being a woman in the uh, macho world of mariachi? Yeah, it was challenging. Um, there was often another. I wasn't the first. So Gilbert Velas actually was one of the, he was the first guy in Tucson that hired a woman. And it was actually a woman um, who went to go play at Los Camperos in L.A. She was from here, Monica, what was her last name? Um, so a Tucson, a Tucson woman was one of the first to play in a group in, in LA. It was, it had its special challenges. And people have often asked me, why did I use Andy Veracruz as, you know, why didn't you write it from, you know, have a female character? I think it was because for so long, I played with all these guys and we would play, we would have a gig, we would play like for an hour and then have a half hour gig and then we played another another hour and stuff like that. So I had a lot of breaks with these guys. We spent a lot of time with them. And I, I think I just felt like I knew how they thought. Um, 
they, they were so interesting to observe. Let me give you an example. We were on stage one time. It was just hysterical. So, okay, so we're on stage and there's a bathroom over there. And sometimes the restaurant was crowded. So this one night in particular, I remember this one lady and she, you know, very nicely dressed and, you know, tight shirt, high heels. So she comes and she walks kind of in front of the stage, crosses right in front of all of us and goes over towards the bathroom. And the guys, I, I'm standing in front, but I see all together how they go. And watch this woman. It was so funny just to see how, how they thought and how they thought about things. And, you know, we had all these breaks together. I heard stuff. So it was really fun. But yeah, a, a couple of guys, I had to let them know, no, I am not interested. No, I'm really not interested. And since you asked, I'll indulge you with the story of how I got my nickname, which in the orchestra, which in, in the mariachis, La Platanita. And I'm sorry, somebody already read about this, but, um, but anyway, it's kind of a fun, fun story. So we had this, this guy that played with this. He was called Platano. That was his nickname because he had a really long nose. Um, he was a real thin guy, long nose. Platano means banana. All right. But he, he poor guy, he was a terrible alcoholic. He could play drunk, so drunk he couldn't walk. Um, play beautifully, but he drank too much. Well, anyway, one night after we finished playing, we were sitting there at the, at the bar area. And he comes over to me. You know, we're just, you know, several of us are sitting there. And we're, we were on benches. It was a bar. So there were, you know, high, high stools, I guess I should say. He puts his hand on my, on my leg. I'm wearing a skirt like I am right now, kind of a long, long skirt. So I gently put his hand down. He does it again. I put his hand down. I know he was drunk, but anyway, he does it a third time. I pushed him so hard, he fell off the stool. The guys thought this was hysterical. So by the next day, when I got to the restaurant, Urbano, the, the, the biggest person who would make up nicknames, immediately called me Platanita, which means little banana. From then, and I knew, I knew right away, there is no way I can live this down. No matter what I say, this is gonna be my nickname. I might as well just give in to it. And so, yes, in the mariachi world, I'm still La Platanita from the time I had to push Platano out of the way. And off the, off I, the I, stage, right. <laughs> I know he was drunk, I should have been nicer to him, but you know, the third time was just one time too many. So one time go. too many, yeah. We actually have several questions here. So let's just uh, quickly go through these because we're, um, I, we only have a few more minutes left here. So somebody would like to see the outfit, the whole outfit you're wearing. And, um, and if you could just make any comments upon it. I think I can walk far enough away yeah, I can almost. Yeah, good. I hadn't thought, I hadn't anticipated this question, so I'm walking far away. Yeah, and if you stop, then well, you've just disappeared into the ocean. You need. Well, to... I do like to swim, so that's. Yeah, okay. yeah. Okay, that's better. That's better. So, so you want to? That's we... good. Do you want to comment for just a minute on your on your costume? Yeah, we jingle when we walk. Yeah. So um, I wear a skirt that goes down. I, I didn't put on my boots. So I, anyway, I wear a skirt that goes it's about, about mid calf. Some of the girls like to wear a, a skirt that goes all the way up, but I don't like to do that uh, all the way up. That goes all the way down, but then it's hard to walk around. And a lot of times you're on stage and uh, I find that very uncomfortable. So I like the calf length. And then, okay, so you have these jingle things. These are, you can't maybe see it very well, but these are Mexican sundials. So that's a very common adorno to have on your traje, the Mexican sundials. I have another one where they're like, um, they're roosters, but those kind of, they, they fight with each other. So the sundials are actually nicer and some of them are heavier than others. So actually a sundial in a light metal works the best. Um, and then we wear the jacket and then we wear this moño, which actually is kind of uncomfortable, um, but these special ties it's just a tradition. What it came from, though, was from like the charro, the, the charros, and they would have, when they did horse events, 
they would wear these fancy clothes. So that's where the mariachi gets it from. It's from the charro tradition. So if you look at some of those clothing or if you look at some old photographs where they have charro events, you'll see very similar outfits. We used to have a really nice outfit that was gray, but the problem is, you know, just when you think everything is going fine, then somebody quits and then you're working with new musicians. So it's just easier to at least have one outfit that's black because almost everybody's going to have a black outfit and then you'll be able to blend in. Of course, you have to be careful not to, you know, not to change uh, size too often because it's really a pain in the neck to get one of these skirts. But, but anyway, now you can order them online, but we, we got ours. We went to Mexico to get them done. That's great. Um, another question is, did you ever get in trouble making up a character and he or she is too similar, maybe in a negative way to somebody you've played with? You know, I should have gotten into trouble by now, but no. Um, in fact, it went the, uh, I had somebody in mind for substitute solos, but anyway, hasn't seemed to notice herself yet. That's in, great. Instead, in, instead, I had the opposite. I had a guy who, um, well, he's retired now, but he used to cut cut the, the the tree limbs. And his wife read the book, and then he called me up. And he said, "You put me in the book. I'm the detective. You described me exactly." Trust me, I was not thinking of him, not in the least. But that's okay. I just said, "Yes." Aren't you glad you're in the book and you're a good detective? <laughs> uh, another person asked, "Why did you set the uh, first book in San Diego instead of Tucson?" Um, I said, I'll tell you what, I said it in Southern California. I, um, I made up the place. I called it Squid Bay. But the reason was I knew that Andy was going to get into so much trouble that he was going to have to leave. So that made it that made it easier for me to, to make him have to leave. And then in Dizzy and Durango, uh, he spends part of that book in Tucson. And then in Substitute Solos, he spends part of it in Tucson. That's great. We have a comment here that um, Helen Quigley says that she's seen you at parties and thank you for the great music. And um, this will be our last question here for the for this uh, wonderful evening. Um, when when were women allowed in mariachi ba uh, bands? Were they banned or just uncommon? Um, in Mexico, it works like this. In Mexico, well, I was living there in the 80s, so that was a while ago. Okay, I have to admit that. But in the 80s, you know, guys could do whatever they want, but women were supposed to like be at home and stuff like that. So they weren't really invited to be in mariachi groups. Also, very few women knew how to play an instrument. You would see a woman sing with a mariachi. So a mariachi might be giving a special presentation and a woman might come in and sing like five, six songs. She even might have an outfit like this one, but she didn't play with the gang and stay out all night with the gang going from one party to another. So it really wasn't until, you know, it was in the U.S. that this started. And Tucson is one of the first places that had any women in the group. Gilbert really felt like, well, you know, what's the difference? You know, if you can play the music, that's really all that counts. But he, he was sort of ahead of the game with that. And then the guy, Nati Cano in, in L.A., in Los Camperos, who hired Monica, he was kind of ahead of it, too. So it's been a slow evolution. And now some of the groups have just women, but... To tell you the truth, I don't like I don't like that sound as much. I like the sound of the deeper voices. So I, I prefer a mix myself, but but anyway, that's that's how it that's how it came about. That's great. Well, I we just can't thank you enough here, um, uh, Diane Rainsdale, for sharing all your wonderful stories with us and your music and your books. I want to encourage everyone that um, Dr. Ransdell's books are available um, for your borrowing pleasure from the Pima County um, uh, library system. So you can order them and pick them up at your library. Um, I also want to let you know our next speaker is going to be Dr. Susan Cummins Miller. And uh, this is on Tuesday, February 16th at 2 p.m. in the afternoon. And um, Susan Cummins Miller is a um, uh, both a writer, but she also was a professor of geology. So she's going to be talking about stories in stone and um, the use of place and uh, geology and so forth in her writing. Anyway, remember that uh, next day, February 16th. Oh, and Elise, it looks like Mike Hayes, our third speaker, is, is in the room as we speak. In the room, you're absolutely right. And Mike is going to be speaking 
in March, the third uh, Saturday in March, also at two o'clock. And uh, we're looking forward to having him. And then also we have our fourth speaker, which is Kathy McIntosh. She's gonna be speaking the third uh, Tuesday in April at 7 p.m. So uh, we are so blessed to have all of you here with us tonight. And if you're not on DR's mailing list, um, you might just look her up there, at, look up her website, and I know she'd be delighted to add you to her mailing list. And if you're not yet a member of the Friends of the Kirk Bear Canyon Library, you can go to PayPal and uh, just put in our Gmail address, which is friends KBC Library. That's friends KBC Library at gmail.com. And you can join for just $10. And um, we would love to have your support. We're so grateful that you were all here today. Please tell all of your friends to join us for next month. And um, Susan Commons Miller's talk, Stories in Stone, February 16th at 2 p.m. And we just want to thank all of you. And again, thank you so much, um, Diane, for this amazing talk. We just loved every second of it. You were just a wonderful kickoff. Thanks so much. So glad you enjoyed it. Thanks for coming and staying the whole time.